And with us today, um, we have two people from Salesforce, Lauren Rousen um, and Avantika Ramish. And we also have uh, two people, two representatives from One Off, Jennifer Stiles and Christopher Seely. So please welcome them to the stage. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here today on the main stage for our panel. Uh, my name is Avantika Ramesh. I'm a product manager at Salesforce, and I'm joined by panelists from both One Of and Salesforce. So thank you for joining us. You know, I think before we get started, it's worth acknowledging kind of the shift that we've seen in the themes with NFT NYC between the years. And this year, our focus, especially for this panel, is building brand loyalty in Web3. But I've also seen that theme a lot more prominent this year than in past years. So I love that we've been moving so fast. The space has been evolving. We've moved from talking about crypto, DeFi, infra, to actual adoption for brands. So we're here to talk about brand adoption. I'm going to go ahead and have our panelists introduce themselves, and then we'll get right into our conversation. So Laura, do you want to start off? Sure, I'll kick off. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Laura Rosen. I am an investor in Salesforce's Venture Capital Fund. Um, Salesforce Ventures is a global multi-stage fund investing in enterprise software companies, including Web3, um, typically from the Series A and up. Um, our team's based globally. I'm based here in New York, um, and I'm very excited to be here today. Great. Hello, everyone. I'm Jennifer Stiles. I'm the Vice President of Communications at One Of, and I'm uh, based in Miami. My colleague. Hi, I'm Christopher Seely. I'm the Senior Vice President and Creative Director of One Of, uh, and I also am a general partner in a crypto fund of funds called Chainlink Capital. Awesome. And my name is Avantika Ramesh, Senior Product Manager at Salesforce. And as you can see here, we have a very diverse crew of panelists. And because we have both Salesforce and One Of represented, I would love for us to maybe quickly dive into what we do specifically as it relates to brands and loyalty. So maybe Chris or Jen, if you can tell us. Sure. Um, you know, I, I think when it comes to brands and loyalty, I think we as consumers and just as people, um, we've experienced a shift. You know, we realize that big tech platforms don't serve us in the way that we thought. You know, our privacy and data can be compromised, and we're part of a very, very robust value chain that doesn't really pay much to us. So as we began this Web3 journey, it was really about community. It was about creating communities, first of artists, then of investors, and always of builders, um, where people could be part of this value chain, be themselves, and have something really deep. Um, and at one of last year, we got on stage and talked about that community, specifically focused around digital collectibles. We are known for having a very uh, successful marketplace across music, entertainment, et cetera. Uh, and we've done some of the biggest releases, such as Notorious, B.I.G., Doja Cat, et cetera. Um, what we were always doing, though, under the hood, which I think is coming to light in this new environment um, as investment cycles sort of vacillate, uh, is building what we felt was best-in-class technology. Uh, to power these marketplaces. So not just marketplace tech, but loyalty and sort of gamification tech to get our customers uh, involved. And I think most critically, um, a truly universal decentralized identity called one of that goes sort of way beyond, no, called, sorry, one wallet uh, that goes way beyond your typical Web3 wallet and critically allowed our consumers to plug in at any level of tech savviness or Web3 familiarity uh, by you know, uh, sell and trade digital assets. And so now what we're doing with our recent announcement is making that available as one platform, which is simply an enterprise solution for brands who sort of want to rely on sort of the battle-tested folks who've been engaging consumers and use that to ignite their audiences that are quite loyal to them and want to take a step deeper. Very cool. Jen, anything else to share? No, I mean, Chris crushed it. <laughs> Amazing. Well, I think it's also worth sharing a little bit more about how Salesforce has been involved in this space. Salesforce, our bread and butter is CRM, customer relationship management. And when we think about how Salesforce has been involved in the Web2 space and powering customer loyalty, typically we have a platform for managing your customer data, activating on marketing campaigns, loyalty campaigns. And when Web3 emerged, we thought, you know, how are brands actually going to manage all this data? And as we spoke to brands, a lot of them were either managing it on Excel spreadsheets or they were not owning the data at all from their activations. So we thought it was critical for them to be able to ingest that data 
in a platform where they hold the rest of their customer data. If you think about it, in Web3, your customer is interacting through a wallet, and it's important to be able to identify those wallets, integrate them with where the rest of your customer data is, and also activate on rede utility redemption and all the perks that they deserve. So a centralized place to actually manage all of that. So that's kind of Salesforce's role in this space, helping customers create and distribute non-fungible tokens, but also manage the data that comes with that and activate on it. So Laura, you've been a great partner to our product team. I'd love to hear kind of your take from the Salesforce venture side. You've been working with several startups in this space. A lot of them have loyalty solutions. So I'd love to see kind of what you've been seeing, some of the trends, and what also guides some of your investments. Totally, I love working with your team. Um, I think where we began to get really excited was when we really heard from you about enterprises who are increasingly engaging and exploring Web3 strategies. Um, and we began to think through what is really needed to drive that greater adoption. What is the infrastructure that needs to be built? What complexity needs to be extrapolated away to A, enable potentially not Web3 native companies to participate, but also their consumers and users. So we spent a bunch of time around the infrastructure layers. Um, we've also, I think, particularly as we're seeing more around loyalty and customer engagement schemes, getting really excited about the data and analytics piece. I think that is really, really important for brands and companies to derive value from their Web3 strategy. Um, so we've been looking a lot at that. Um, and then relatedly kind of attribution and marketing. Very cool. Now, speaking of investments in this space, it looks like one of had some recent news, right? You all had an acquisition, so tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure. Um, we had some exciting news that came out on CoinDesk last week um, about our one of acquisition with Tap Network, uh, it, and it's it's great. One of it has been doing this for several years since 2018, so this isn't new. Like Chris had said, like back of the house, we've been building this technology to really help and support brands grow and utilize. Um, utilize a Web3 strategy that will enable so many people. I'm a consumer, like I, I'm a loyalty person. So for me, it resonates very well. Like I, I'm loyal to my credit card, I'm loyal to my airline. And for me to be able to trade or utilize utility in this way, like I see the vision of it and I see the future on how Web3 can really help and empower um, consumers like myself to utilize um, your loyalty and your rewards points. And that's something that, um, you know, it, it's already been happening. And I think in the next year or two, it's just, it's, it's gonna go without being said. And people won't even know it's Web3. They won't even say Web3. They'll just be like, oh, you're exchanging, you're utilizing your rewards in a different way. Yeah, and I would just add with Tap Network, I mean, in, at one of, we are a technology company, but ultimately we're in the business of delivering consumer engagement results to brands, helping brands build their business. And so while we have a really robust suite of Web3 tools, what acquiring Tap allowed us to do is acquire the knowledge base and the tools that actually drive consumer loyalty, the science, the gamification, that was really, I think, something we needed. So we're not just providing a tool set, we're providing that operational know-how. Because, you know, the thing that I encounter when I talk to brands about, you know, Web3 technology, everyone sees it's the future. Um, but I think the key for all of us in this room, in any sector of the Web3 space, particularly when it comes to brands, you need to tell a brand how it can help them today. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really where TAP's acquisition comes in and where a lot of the good work that Jen and others comes in. No, that's wonderful to hear. I think it's very strategic, especially as it relates to loyalty programs, right? I think brands are now starting to realize that bi-directional value and the value that they need to provide to their consumers. If you're invested in the brand, you own a portion of the brand's IP, they also expect something in return to keep that engagement going. Now that brings me to question, can you tell me a little bit more about the brands you've been working with? Some examples or how you na help them navigate that transition, seeing what they have currently today and kind of what the vision is for the future. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we did a, a with Amex, for example, um, they're an investor in, in one of, and we made that announcement back in September. In Bordrum, Turkey, we had um, we had a 
you could you were able to as a as a platinum member you were able to purchase um, not purchase but utilize a digital collectible and have a ticket per se to uh, have a chef's dinner or an experience that you typically wouldn't be able to get without this special reward or loyalty program. And I, I think things like that, that you, you have the extra white glove, high touch moment for your loyal users, it, it goes very far and it means so much. Uh, like I said, I'm a loyalty person. So the more that brands can, can participate and show their appreciation for their customers, the bigger the brands will be. Yeah, and I would just say, you know, a lot of the brand stuff we're sort of unable to talk about because those brands make their announcements, right? We're not their PR department. Um, but I would just <laughs> say that I think what Jen said is very important because, you know, when you have a new product or a new type of technology, um, and you're a brand or really anybody, you cannot expect consumers to change their consumption style to even investigate your product. You either need something that is unalienable, you know, just absolutely necessary and consumers will jump through any hoop, or if you're introducing something new, however powerful, you need to make it easy for them. So a lot of the things that um, we will be doing with brands are very sophisticated underneath the hood, but they come across to consumers as just very sort of everyday engagement opportunities. But because they're built on a blockchain native platform, which one of is built on Hyperledger, they're afforded the same sort of uh, data privacy protections, they're afforded the same sort of uh, ability to choose, ability to restrict information, and they really become part of the value chain. So I think at the beginning, for the consumer, if I'm being honest, it won't feel very different. Right. Um, but as they become valued in a real way versus just in a marketing sense, um, it will, I think, transform the consumer brand relationship in ways that both sides need. Yeah, that's so interesting to hear, especially as we talk about adoption, making the whole end-to-end -end experience a lot easier, both for the brand, but equally for the consumer, right? It's both of them are invested in this, and it's really critical to reach that stage. Laura, you've also had exposure to a lot of different companies that are trying to make it easier for brands, whether it's with wallets or within the technology. Do you have any startups that come to mind or maybe even technologies that you're seeing out there that are merging? I probably won't mention specific startups, um, <laughs> but I, I, I very much agree with you. I, I think what's most exciting and where we'll begin to see the biggest adoption is consumers that probably don't even realize that they're using blockchain and maybe that they have a wallet and where you have really, really removed all of the complexity around that onboarding process. Um, you know, uh, quite a few companies we looked at were really looking to like basically make it a lot easier to set up a wallet and onboard into a wallet without having to wait kind of three days for an ACH settlement. Um, and I think kind of looking further out, I think where I probably get kind of most excited it may, maybe not even further out, maybe near term, is where you see existing things, existing membership programs, existing relationships with customers, um, just made a lot easier with a lot more value and a lot more targeted. Like I think there's a lot that can be done to be much more focused in creating, sustaining a community and aligning interests between a brand and the user. Um, so yeah, it's, it's exciting. Very cool. And speaking of technologies, you know, we've started seeing new technologies emerge in the Web3 space, especially around dynamic NFTs, subscription-based NFTs. I'm curious to see if, you know, there are certain innovations you've been seeing recently that kind of amplify this loyalty story and kind of help promote that use case. Well, one of the things that one of did I, I loved was we had a partnership with iHeartRadio where we, we gave a million NFTs to the iHeartRadio Music Festival. And that was our kickoff and our, our launch to one of like, you know, I guess it's almost two years ago now, which is unbelievable. Wow. But to be able to give a million digital collectibles to fans that have that experience, and we partnered with Corey Van Lu, who is a creator and an artist, very well known in the, in the space, and had that hand-to-hand -hand combat, that that touch that really made the fans and the ticket or the concert goers it just makes you feel special. And that is important, I, I believe, as a consumer. It it's just what's the experience? And that's where we can, as one of, we can really help amplify brands' experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would also just say the augmented reality uh, mm -hmm. 
stuff that you see with you know the Tiffany's billboard and trying the jewelry on I think is, is incredible. And you know the thing that everyone talks about but few of us understand and none of us can appreciate because we are not a computer is the power of AI. Um, and not just transforming uh, the Web3 landscape, but transforming the creator landscape. You know, how can we create tool sets um, so that, you know, I if Web3 is supposed to put humans in the value chain, how can that persist in a world where computers are now doing a lot of the things that humans do? Um, I have no smart answers to that at the moment, but I, I, <laughs> I will tell you, um, I think the sort of, uh, the, the nature of blockchain technology and tracking provenance and tracking ownership and tracking value, I think that could be a real key to unlocking that. Um, because you know, the origin of things, I think, is gonna start to be much more important when we can no longer discern what's human, what's real, what's not real, et cetera. Um, and I think rewarding people for being part of an ecosystem um, is gonna be something that this type of technology may do better than most. And also remembering the collectibles that you have in your wallet. So you can right. go into your wallet and you can be like, oh, I remember that moment. That was a special experience for myself. And I mean, I, I look back over the past several years that I've been in the space and I'm just like, wow, this, this, we've evolved so much and there's so much more to come. And it's just an exciting time. I would agree. Yeah. I, I was going to piggyback on Chris. I, I think the application of AI will be so interesting because of the richness of the data set on blockchain. Um, and generative AI like allows you to interrogate that. So to be able to enable a business user, so not even a technical user, to say, hey, I don't know, I, I'm a big brand. Um, I'm really interested in that competing brands kind of customer set. Can, can you tell me something about their NFT owners? And to be able to like ask questions and really understand the user in that way is, is really cool. And I think that's how you see it coming together. Like an amazing data set that people, that is very usable. Yeah, I love how you mentioned the insights from the data, right? I think that's where AI from what was before to how it's evolved to generative AI that we see today, ChatGPT, OpenAI, I think that's where the real value is. We start thinking about, oh, AI is taking over, Web3 is kind of shadowed. I think there's a world in which the two converge and actually make this experience a lot richer for brands, whether it's gathering insights from your data, even brands have started auditing their smart contracts through ChatGPT. You just put in your smart contract, you ask ChatGPT to you know, provide an audit. It does a pretty decent job. I wouldn't trust it you know, right now, but um, I think there's a world in which this technology is going. So we're talking about the future here. Um, looking ahead, what do you feel is like that potential watershed moment for Web3 where we will reach that mass adoption, you know, we see a lot more brands in this space, like what needs to happen? Where, where do you see this going? Well, listen, I, I think on, on some level, if you read between the lines, uh, that may be here and we might just not be able to talk about it right now. You know, we're unable to sort of talk about some of our bigger projects. You have some startups you're clearly excited about, <laughs> the twinkle that you can't uh, talk about. Um, and, I, and I think it, particularly with one of over, you know, the next year, you're going to see our one platform roll out to support some of the biggest brands in the world. Um, but I think more broadly to really reach mass adoption, I, I think we have to honestly issue a challenge to ourselves, everyone in this room, part of this community. And that is to sort of go back to our roots a bit. I mean, you know, I am someone who creates NFTs, literally designs them for a company that sells them. I'm someone who owns NFTs and hopes they appreciate or, or become more emotionally important to me. I'm someone who runs a crypto fund of funds that you know depends on market cycles to, to draw profits. Um, but I think that always the most interesting conversation around Web3 has been one that decouples it from finance and financial instruments. Um, when we started one of, we didn't say, hey, let's start an NFT company so that we can shill and, and do some coin sales and leave. We said, wow, this technology is transformative and the communities that are self-organizing around these technologies are powerful and, and unique to things that we had seen in our lifetimes. Similarly with Chainlink Capital, we've built an incredibly successful fund by investing in the ingenuity of teams and the technical acumen of engineers. We can't predict the future, but we can tell you who's got the best ideas. And so I think that as much as all of us obviously being here have a stake in the value, both financial and emotional, of these collectibles that we hold dear and these digital assets that we trade, it all started through the power of blockchain technology. And I think we're seeing a return to that 
as the market uh, does what it does, both up and down. Um, mm -hmm. So I think this sort of forced return to the properties of what make you know blockchain so valuable from a data side, as you've both said, from a really a, a consumer empowerment side, that's what we in this room have to all support and move forward. And I'm really happy to say that in the conversations that I've been having just outside these panels, that's where a lot of people are moving. So yes, we all want the market to go up, but I think key to that is developing out these use cases so that we can finally say, hey, Web3 is not a technology without a problem to solve. It's a technology that is an endemic solutions provider within society. I love that. I agree with everything you're saying. and. But I also, I also think it's an incredible way for brands to reach consumers that they've never been able to touch before or engage with. Um, I, was, I was at the Samsung Future Plus event yesterday, speaking with a lot of different brands and how they're able to partner with creators and artists and musicians and touch people that, that they've never been a consumer before. And I, I'm like, what, this, j j there's just so much opportunity for brands to really take it to the next level in different ways that they, that speaks volumes. Yeah, I, I mean, in terms of really driving adoption, I think it's proving out real utility. It's showing people who, you know, maybe aren't in this room, maybe are scared by Web3, that it has real value in their lives and that it makes things that they already participate in better. Um, and I think it, the onus is on people here to really communicate that and to prove that out. And I love to see kind of more traditional brands engaging with this because I think, you know, they will engage with their consumers and those consumers will then will continue to propagate. But you have to show the utility. Um, I actually, I, I obviously we're in a, a crypto downturn now, but I, in a way I, I think that is maybe a good thing, like the frothiness has ebbed out of the market. It's leaving people who are building to solve real problems. Um, and, you know, potentially even if it's pushed some Web3 people into Web2 world, actually that's a really good opportunity to advocate. So I, I, I think we'll come out of this a lot stronger in a way. Yeah, you know, one of our investors at one of, Bill Tai, who's very well known across the space at a meeting yesterday said, you know, Obviously, the market downturn and the headwinds that we're facing in the macroeconomic market will thin the forest, um, but those trees who are strong enough to keep standing, they're, they're gonna get more light and more rain and more of what they need. So I guess I would just say any of you who is here in this audience or watching that is a builder and is feeling good about it, um, these challenges, I think, are so long as they can be navigated by you, um, they're really fortifying you in a way that a year ago, it would be harder to stand out from the crowd. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love the perspectives here. I love that you mentioned like the market and how it's changed our perspective and really tested this because I think before it was hard for brands to even understand the value, right? It was all about speculation and you know driving instant revenue and that's why brands were kind of involved in this space. And then it's forced us to completely change the narrative. Think about the technology that underlies this and think about revolutionary ways to up-level the way that they connect with their customers. And Jen, you brought up an important point where you know, you're starting to connect with people that you've never connected before, right? And when brands think about this, they definitely do need to think about approaching that Web3 consumer base that they've never connected with before without alienating the Web2 consumers. And I think it's a beautiful moment when you're able to kind of bring both audiences into this new initiative together and not alienate either community. And then as you said, there's also an ecosystem that forms around the brand, around artists and collaborations that they've never thought about before. So we speak about all of this. I'm curious, do you have any favorite brands? N maybe not the ones that you've worked with, but we've seen a lot of examples like Adidas and Starbucks who've done these kind of loyalty programs. Any that stick out to you? And yeah, I'm a Boss Beauty holder, and I, Ooh, I love the Boss Beauty I community. I love the Boss Beauty. They're my yeah. girls. Uh, but they did a recent collaboration with NARS, and it, you know, I'm... I typically don't find ours, but now I do. <laughs> so it's it's a very use case scenario. I have NFT too. <laughs> and because I, I feel a part of the community and I want to support the brand and I appreciate that they're supporting these creators and these artists. And it's also just a great way for artists and creators to um, make money and financially support themselves in different ways that they wouldn't be able to, uh, which I think is really cool. Um, but yeah, that's that's my one. 
right now. I have many, but. <laughs> oh, I, I love the work your team did with scotch and soda. I Ooh. thought that was really good. Tell us about it. <laughs> um, I, I think, <laughs> well, I, you know, what made it so cool was that I think it was actually the fact that they were able to address individuals who maybe were very unfamiliar exactly. with what, who would be scared to set up a wallet, basically, maybe didn't even know what the wallet was. And it was able to like take them through that process um, because they were engaged with the brand. And then in going through the process, they became even more engaged with the brand. It was, it was really cool to see. And I think it was both of our first times actually understanding what the experience was see? like. <laughs> and we were like, wow, our, we built the product. Now we're going to launch it, get the customer on it. And then we were like, wow, how is it for the end user to actually go and mint these NFTs? And it was on Polygon. We were like, oh my gosh, we need to get, you know, Matic on our wallets. We navigated the whole experience. But it was beautiful that, you know, the consumers were willing to engage with the brands in that way. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, all right. Yes, we're going to bring so up our next speaker us. now.